thank you for joining us today. Um, it's a rather sober day uh, in light of the events unfolding in Eastern Europe right now, and uh, and and as I speak, and I'm sure that I uh, that I can speak for all of us that uh, we're of one mind and hoping for peace and stability in that region uh, very very soon. And um, Anyway, so, so my name is uh, Doug Tady, and I'm a professor and head of the uh, Department of Human Development and Family Studies at Penn State. Uh, I'm delighted to be joined by two people whom I consider to be among the superstars in the area of sleep and family systems. We have Dr. Leah Tokatsky in the Department of Psychology at Ben Gurion University of the Negev, and Dr. Helen Ball of the Durham Infancy and Sleep Center uh, in the Department of Anthropology at Durham University. Both uh, Liat and Helen joined me as co-editors of Sleep Health's special issue on sleep in the family system. And each of them have made significant and very important contributions that have shaped the field. Uh, and of course, we're delighted also to be joined today by our two very distinguished speakers whose contributions to the special issue uh, will be showcased today, uh, namely Dr. Maureen McQuillan from Indiana University and Dr. Kathy Proper uh, of UNC Chapel Hill. This webinar is, of course, an extension of the special issue, and I want to take a minute to thank Orfeo Buxton, the editor-in-chief of Sleep Health, for his support, guidance, and his vision in putting this special issue and the webinar together. Uh, I want to thank Amanda Applegate, Sleep Health's editorial assistant, who is so instrumental in more ways than I can count in helping us as the special issue and this webinar took shape. Uh, I wish to acknowledge the support of the National Sleep Foundation, which publishes Sleep Health for its support of the special issue. And uh, I also want to thank Bobby and Inna and Stephanie and other folks who are affiliated with El Sebier, um, who uh, have also been very instrumental in helping us uh, put this together for their technical expertise, their marketing expertise, et cetera. Okay. So the special issue and this webinar is a reflection of the growing recognition of the need to study sleep processes in order to better understand the health of the family system and to appreciate how deeply sleep and family processes are mutually uh, influential and intertwined. The special issue covers a broad array of topics. They include how sleep between family members is linked, how sleep influences parent-child processes and mental health, and how sleep in families is influenced by the larger environment, and also how sleep mediates and moderates the impact of environmental influences on families and family members. It also includes several papers examining sleep and family processes in non-Western cultures, an area of focus that we believe is in great need of further study. Both Maureen and Kathy will be describing studies that are superb examples illustrating the role of maternal sleep in parental functioning and the role of infant sleep as a predictor of child development down the road. Uh, just speaking for myself, my own focus in this area for the last 17 or so years draws from my broader interest in how parenting impacts early child development, particularly socio-emotional development, but also now a school adjustment. Uh, I, I came to realize that when you integrate uh, parent and infant sleep into this focus, you see how much sleep influences parenting and how sleep helps to identify parent-child influences that flow in both directions. This interest led me to several federally funded longitudinal studies focusing on infants and young children and their families, broadly examining how parent and child sleep affects and is affected by parent-child relationships and early child development and school adjustment. One of the signature features of my work uh, are naturalistic observations using low lux uh, cameras uh, of parenting of infants and young children at bedtime and throughout the night, which has yielded a great deal of information and insight uh, into what parents do when they put their children to bed, how they do it, and how all of that is linked up with child and parent sleep and early child development. And also how parents may work or may perhaps not work together in putting with their partners and putting their children to bed and also responding to uh, night, night awakenings, especially parents of infants. And we, there's a lot of individual differences there that we have, that we have found. Uh, you'll find that the bulk of the work that, that's coming out of my lab is published in the Journal of Family Psych. Um, but also uh, you'll find it in uh, sleep medicine and child development, uh, developmental psych, and now happily in sleep health as well. So, so my specific contribution to this special issue was uh, led by one of my very talented graduate students, Caitlin Fronberg, and it demonstrated that linkages between socioeconomic risk and child sleep, which are very well established, appear to be largely mediated by household chaos and family disorganization. Uh, the kids in this study were uh, making the transition to kindergarten 
And given the importance of child sleep and school success, uh, the study suggests that intervention efforts to improve family routines and organization prior to the start of kindergarten have the potential to promote children's adjustment to first time schooling. And that in turn has cascading effects down the road. So I'm going to briefly turn the floor over to Liat and Helen, uh, my uh, co-moderators. And then we're gonna to proceed to hear from Maureen and Kathy. And uh, I just wanna quickly mention to those of you who are, are joining us, that although the, this format doesn't enable you to talk directly to us, you can use the chat feature in Zoom to put in any comments that you wish and the Q&A feature uh, to ask questions. And what we'll do as moderators is carry those questions forward uh, to our speakers and or to the general audience. So we hope to be engaging in lively discussion with everybody, um, with all of you. So please feel free to use the Q&A feature and the chat feature to, to communicate with us and with our speakers. Uh, and now I'd like to turn the floor over to Dr. Tukatsky. Hey, thank you, Doug, and uh, everyone, and thank you for joining. Um, good morning and uh, good evening from Israel. Um, I'm very excited about this event and about the opportunity to discuss this great special issue about sleep in the family context. I'll tell a little bit about myself. Um, I started my journey in the pediatric sleep world about uh, 20 years ago under the supervision of Avi Sadeh, who sadly passed away in 2016. Um, I hope all of you heard about Avi Sadeh and are familiar with parts of his work. Um, I'll just say that Avi was really one of the world's leaders in the field of pediatric sleep. And uh, among his many, many contributions, he developed together with uh, Tom Anders, the transactional model of infant sleep, which uh, described how the development of infant sleep is influenced by complex and dynamic interactions uh, between environmental factors and intrinsic physiological factors. Uh, I always feel that I'm using uh, this model, the transactional model as a theoretical framework for uh, my research. And I think that it greatly inspired the research in our field since it has been first published in uh, 1993. Uh, so when I joined Avi's lab as a PhD student, I became uh, mainly interested in the role of parental sleep-related cognitions and how they relate to uh, infant sleep development. We conducted a longitudinal study and we showed that parental sleep related cognitions measured during a pregnancy and in the postpartum uh, predicted parental uh, soothing behaviors around bedtime, which in turn predicted infant nocturnal wakefulness. Uh, later, we looked at uh, um, other uh, parental factors uh, such as paternal involvement in infant caregiving and, for instance, uh, demonstrated that a higher level of uh, father's involvement in overall uh, infant caregiving, daytime caregiving, predicted uh, better consolidated sleep in infants and mothers. Uh, additional parenting factors that we studied in relation to infant sleep included uh, parental cry tolerance and maternal emotional distress. Um, during the last decade, my research focuses mainly on parental sleep during the postpartum period or during the first and second years of the infant's life. And I'm mainly interested in the implications of disturbed uh, parental sleep on their functioning and on the mother-infant relationships. Uh, in all of our studies, we have always examined both the sleep of uh, infants and parents. Uh, but uh, surprisingly, uh, recently I noticed that actually there has been only very limited work on the direct links between the sleep of infants and uh, parents, specifically when examined with objective measures of sleep. So uh, in the paper that we uh, contributed to the special issue, we were uh, actually interested in examining the nature of uh, these links between uh, maternal and infant sleep. And uh, in particular, we wanted to examine whether the strength of, of these links changes across infant development. Uh, so we conducted a trajectory analysis using uh, HLM, which demonstrated that uh, these links were overall uh, strong uh, across the different time points, but uh, their strengths decreased linearly from uh, three to 18 months postpartum. 
And uh, we believe that this decline in the synchronization between the sleep of infants and mothers uh, may be mainly attributed to the growing ability of infants to self-suit uh, during the night and to resume sleep independently. Uh, we also saw that uh, these links between maternal and infant sleep are stronger uh, for uh, maternal reports than uh, for actigraphy. And uh, finally, we examined whether uh, these links, uh, the strengths of these links are moderated by infant sleeping uh, location, sleeping arrangements. We thought that uh, we will find that the links are stronger in mother-infant uh, diets who uh, share uh, a bedroom in comparison to mothers and infants who sleep separately, but surprisingly, uh, we did not find consistent differences in the strengths of these links as a function of sleeping arrangements. Uh, so these were uh, the main findings of uh, this paper that appears in the special issue, and um, I think that I'll stop here, and I uh, would like to introduce Helen Bow, who will tell us about her wonderful research. Thank you. Thank you very much, Liat, and many thanks to Doug for inviting me to co-edit this special issue of Sleep Health with you both. Um, I'm an anthropologist and professor at Durham University in the UK, where I run the Infancy and Sleep Center. And my research program has been underway for 27 years now, having come to the study of parent-infant sleep from a background in evolutionary and biological anthropology and an interest in mother-baby behavior. Our studies at Durham began as a qualitative exploration of parent-infant sleep landscape in the UK, as we attempted to understand what parents actually did with their babies at night and most importantly, why. This research program has led us to discover that a high and previously unacknowledged proportion of UK parents were regularly sleeping with their babies and they were doing so for a diversity of reasons. The majority of these parents didn't sleep with their babies all night and many of them didn't do so every night. So they didn't consider themselves to be bed sharers or co-sleepers even though it turned out that about half of all UK babies were regularly sleeping with their parents, with 22% being in the parents' bed on any given night. These findings in the late 90s and early 2000s were particularly significant given two apparently competing agendas in the infant care landscape at the time. The promotion of breastfeeding on the one hand and the prevention of SIDS on the other. And for the next 20 years, our research focused on trying to unpick the relationship between breastfeeding and bed sharing, while trying to also understand how parents made sense of the relationship between bed sharing and sudden infant death. Via a series of randomized trials using video observations on the postnatal ward of a large tertiary hospital, we revealed that newborns sleeping at their mother's bedside fed half as frequently during the night as those sleeping in their mother's bed. And that those who bed shared once at home were more than twice as likely to still be breastfeeding at six months than those who didn't. This suggested that prohibiting bed sharing may have detrimental consequences to both breastfed babies and their mothers. And so we went on to examine how bed sharing practices differed for different families exploring the ways in which mothers who breastfeed or didn't arranged their bed, their bedding and their bodies and how cultural differences in infant care practices between white British and Pakistani immigrant mothers resulted in not only very different sleeping practices but very different SIDS outcomes with the immigrant families having a quarter of the cases seen in the native population. One of the impacts of this research has been to underpin substantial changes in UK policy and practice regarding sleep safety guidance, which now takes a more nuanced approach to risk minimization, rather than the blunt risk elimination approach which preceded it. So using video observations and qualitative interviews with parents about how and why sleep happens the way it does within the family context, has been a key focus of my research and that of many of my PhD students. Which brings me to the contribution of this special, uh, our, our contribution to this special issue on sleep in the family system. 
My student Lenka Medvakova Tinkova from the Czech Republic is interested in the role of parents in the sleep of toddlers. Our paper in this special issue focuses on a Czech concept known as Uspavani, which is the, the passive or active soothing of children to sleep using parental presence. Lenka conducted ethnographic fieldwork with Czech families who described Uspavani as a cultural practice, a family tradition, and as a mechanism for calming unsettled toddlers. Similar to bed sharing in the UK at the time of our initial studies, Uspavani is sometimes frowned upon by health practitioners and sleep specialists, particularly those trained in the Anglosphere. But Uspavani is a widespread phenomenon in the Czech Republic with a long history. It's mentioned in centuries old Czech folk tales and historical parenting books and appears by similar names in languages of neighboring countries. Commonly, Czech parents do not expect young children to be able to self-regulate, and parental regulation by means of Uspavani is an important component of the family system. So given our own kind of interests in qualitative research, I was particularly happy to shepherd some fascinating qualitative papers through the review process for this special issue, and I'm pleased to see qualitative studies of sleep more widely being published in Sleep Health. They add an important dimension to the study of human sleep and help us to question some of our assumptions and recognize there is a diversity of legitimate sleep practices. So now it's my great pleasure to introduce the first of today's speakers. Dr. Maureen McQuillan, earned her PhD in clinical science at the Department of Psychological and Brain Sciences at Indiana University in Bloomington, and completed her clinical psychology internship and fellowship at Indiana University School of Medicine in Indianapolis at Riley Hospital for Children. She's now an assistant professor of clinical pediatrics, working in pediatric behavioral sleep medicine and high-risk asthma. Maureen, welcome. We're very much looking forward to hearing your talk today on a one-year longitudinal study of the stress, sleep, and parenting of mothers of toddlers. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Ball. I'll go ahead and share my screen. All right, so as Dr. Ball mentioned, I'll be speaking with you about our paper that was in this wonderful special issue on sleep in the family system entitled A One-Year Longitudinal Study of the Stress, Sleep, and Parenting of Mothers of Toddlers. And I'm very excited to join you all and to continue working with Doug, who's led these efforts of collaboration across multiple research labs that are focused on these topics. And I'm excited to focus on mothers of toddlers because I think Dr. Ball was giving a nice overview and Liat too about um, the sleep of mothers of infants and um, now starting to move in this direction of mothers of toddlers like Dr. Ball was talking about. Um, so we'll get started. I first wanted to start a little bit more about my background. I know Dr. Ball was just given an overview of, of my background, but I wanted to dive into it a little bit more just to be transparent about the lens from which I think about this research and how I was trained and the work that I'm doing now and how um, I think about these things. So um, I was trained at Indiana University in Bloomington, Indiana, working with Dr. Jack Bates. Um, as some of you know, Dr. Bates is a leader in temperament research. Um, he thinks a lot about infant temperament and how temperament manifests across early childhood and how parenting and child temperament can interact with each other. And when I joined his lab, um, he had just started some research on toddler sleep and self-regulation. And I was very interested in how toddler sleep and self-regulation fit within the family system. What, what was the role of the parents? And then during my time at Indiana University, we started collaborating with Dr. Sarah Honecker, who I think is on the call today. And she is at Indiana University School of Medicine in Indianapolis, so just about an hour away from Bloomington, Indiana. And we started collaborating on a project that we called the Family Routine Study while I was in graduate school. 
And in this study, we were testing a behavioral sleep intervention for children with disruptive behavior problems like ADHD and oppositional defiant disorder. And they were getting this treatment, which is a, basically a parent management training protocol to address disruptive behavior problems. And we paired that treatment with a behavioral sleep intervention for children ages three to eight. And we were testing whether the sleep intervention would improve their disruptive behavior problems um, in combination with this standard um, parent management training intervention. And we used an active control condition called the family mealtime program. So that's how I got to know Dr. Sarah Honecker. And I think of these two people as my, uh, you know, key mentors in my career. And then through getting to know Dr. Honecker, I ended up working with her at Indiana University School of Medicine in Indianapolis, where I work now. And um, in my current position, I have two days a week where I'm in our behavioral sleep clinic. Um, I actually see patients in Carmel, Indiana, which is just north of Indianapolis. And um, in our sleep center at Riley Hospital for Children, we offer behavioral sleep intervention for children of all ages. So I, um, in a typical clinic day, I will see an infant, like yesterday I had two 16 month olds where we might be talking about problematic night wakings where the child is waking up frequently in the night and is requiring some form of parental intervention to return to sleep. Then we also see toddlers and preschoolers with things like bedtime resistance and difficulty settling to sleep or sleeping independently. And then I also see more like school age children with some nighttime fears and nightmares. And then I see adolescents with insomnia and delayed sleep phase. So um, really kind of offering interventions for a lot of children of, with a variety of sleep difficulties. And then my other two days a week, I'm fortunately able to continue my sleep research in collaboration with Dr. Jack Bates and Dr. Sarah Honecker. And I really think of my research program as having three main lines of research. The first is the one that we'll be focusing on today, sleep in the family system across early childhood. So it's listed in bold here and it's one of my favorite topics. So I'm so excited to talk with you guys all about this today. Um, and then my newer lines of research in collaboration with Dr. Honecker is looking at adolescent insomnia and some comorbid concerns. So things like chronic pain and mental health issues and how adolescent insomnia develops and how it can be treated most effectively. And then I've also started working in the area of pediatric obstructive sleep apnea, um, addressing health disparities in the detection and treatment of this concern. So that gives you some background on the type of work that I'm doing and the things that I'm thinking about on a day-to-day -day basis in, in my current position. And now, without further ado, we can jump into the focus um, for this study. So for this study, I first want to acknowledge our funders. This work was funded by a grant from NIMH and my wonderful co-author. So Dr. Jack Bates, who I've already mentioned frequently, and then Dr. Kirby Dieter Deckard, who's also an expert in, in family research. Um, he's at UMass Amherst, but at the time of our study, he was at Virginia Tech. And then another leader is Dr. Angela Staples, who's a former graduate student of Dr. Jack Bates. She's now at Eastern Michigan University and she shares my interest in studying mother's sleep and mother's functioning um, relative to their child's sleep and functioning. And then of course, I also want to acknowledge our amazing team of research assistants who contributed to this research. Um, as you'll see, when we get into the details of the study, um, this research would not be possible without the boots on the ground going into homes and really observing these family interactions and doing so in a respectful, non-invasive way. So I really want to give a lot of credit to these amazing research assistants, just a few of whom are pictured here um, at Jack Bates's house. All right, so now we'll dive into the research. Um, Earlier, Doug mentioned some of his wonderful research that's been published in Journal of Family Psychology. And I wanted to start with this study of ours that was published in Journal of Family Psychology that 
I think of as kind of the um, starting point for the current study. Um, in this study, it was just a cross-sectional study looking at mothers of two and a half year olds. And I really was focusing on that group because there was so much excellent research about mothers sleep in the postpartum and infancy period, but less about after that period. And of course, toddlerhood is an interesting time. Toddlers are very willful. Their sleep is in transition as they're starting to drop naps and maybe starting to sleep independently and those sorts of things. So I was very interested in mother sleep and how it would be connected with their stress and parenting. And to measure parenting, we use this measure of observed positive parenting. So those research assistants that I mentioned, they went into the home and observed the bedtime routine. So we would ask families, when does your child usually go to bed? And then we would arrive one hour prior to that and just observe what was going on. Some families had a set routine and they knew that we would be watching their routine, but other families, they were just having dinner, watching a movie, maybe there isn't a set bedtime routine. And regardless of, of the family's plan for the evening, we would just observe for the hour before the child was put to bed. And we rated the amount of positive parenting that was observed, and I'll get into those details later. And in this initial study, what we found is that a variety of sleep indexes, all measured actigraphically, so using those objective measures that Liat was talking about, um, were significantly predictive of this positive parenting construct above and beyond other factors. So this CRI is a cumulative risk index of stress. So what we found is actigraphic sleep predicted less positive parenting. If you had more sleep problems, less positive parenting above and beyond the effects of stress, maternal age, how much mom worked outside of the home and how many children she was raising. And another notable finding from this initial study was this was specifically with actigraphic data. We, we also gave the moms the Pittsburgh Sleep Quality Index. And although that was linked with parenting and with stress, it wasn't linked with parenting above and beyond the effects of stress. So it just wasn't a strong enough effect compared to what was observed objectively. So this was a pretty exciting finding, but we wanted to extend that work in a longitudinal study. And we knew that a longitudinal study would allow us to answer a few more questions. So one was to look at how mother stress and sleep were linked across a year of toddlerhood. So not just this one time point, but across a year as that toddler is developing and as the family system is potentially changing with maybe a new baby and things like that, um, how did mother's ratings of stress predict her sleep across time? And how did her sleep predict stress across time? The other thing we wanted to do is look at how mother's sleep deficits would actually predict change in parenting across time. So not just within one time point is more sleep problems linked with less positive parenting, but could we really see change in parenting across time? And then lastly, I was interested in this mediation effect that, that Doug was mentioning at the beginning today about how maybe sleep could be the mediator between a well-established link between stress and parenting. There's a lot of research about parental stress and its effect on parenting, but sometimes sleep deficits wasn't looked at as a form of, of stress that might affect parenting in this really proximal way. So I was hoping to test all of these things in this present study. And to do it, we used a cross-lagged panel model, um, which is a structural equation modeling approach, um, which has some advantages. And, and of course, there's other models that are great too. Um, one advantage of this type of model is it allows you to form latent constructs using structural equation modeling um, to parse out some measurement error in the indicators that you're using. So we formed latent constructs of stress, sleep, and parenting to look at within time associations, which would essentially be a replication of that first study that I was talking about, but then extend that out and look at it across time while accounting for those within time associations, cross time continuity within each construct and cross time associations between each construct. So really allows you to account for all of these effects and really rigorously test a potential mediation effect. 
So these lines here in bold was that proposed mediation effect that we were thinking we would find. And to do this, we use data from that toddler development study where we collected data on 413 mother-child pairs at two and a half, and then followed them again six months later when the toddlers were three, and then when they were three and a half. And these data were collected at both Bloomington, Indiana, and at Virginia Tech, where Dr. Kirby Dieter Deckard was the, the co-PI. And one thing to note is um, we did have some missingness. So from 36 to 42 months, that was planned missingness. So when we submitted these grants, um, we proposed to only have Virginia Tech collect data at the first two time points. So some drop off there was planned missingness. At each of these time points, we had moms complete a number of questionnaires about stress that she might experience in her life. We also had moms wear actigraphs for two weeks at each of the time points. And then we had those research assistants go into the home at each of the time points to observe the bedtime. In terms of our sample, it's important to acknowledge that these moms were around age 32. They were a middle-class sample. We did have a range of SES, but overall this was a middle-class sample. Overall, this was a predominantly white married sample. We did have some breakdown in terms of how much mothers worked, which I think is interesting to note. It broke down in about third. So one third worked outside of the home full-time, one third worked about part-time outside of the home, and one third did not work outside of the home. And to get into the nitty gritty of our measures, to measure stress, I mentioned before that we formed latent constructs at each age using three indicators. And I'll show you some sample items of those stress measures. So one is the, the well-known chaos measure. So this stands for confusion, hubbub, and order scale. And some of the sample items are things like we almost always seem to be rushed or no matter how hard we try, we always seem to be running late. You can't hear yourself think in our home, these sorts of things. We also had families complete the parenting daily events scale. And this gives you an indicator of different tasks that parents have. And then they rated how much of a hassle each task was for them. So things like having to clean up messes or having to hear children complaining or when children don't listen, how much of a hassle is that for that particular parent? And then one of my favorite scales, the Riley roll overload scale. So um, this is a six item index where we ask mothers these questions. So things like, I can never seem to catch up. I don't have time for myself. There are times when I can't meet everyone's expectations. We had moms complete this questionnaire as well. And what we found in that latent construct image that I was showing you is that these three questionnaires converged and formed a latent construct at each age. To measure sleep, um, I mentioned before our collaboration with Dr. Angela Staples. She has a previous study published in 2019 where she really um, looked at the measurement of mother and toddler sleep using actigraphs. And as many of you know who do actigraphy research, actigraphy produces a lot of variables. And there's some selection um, that goes into which variables are tested. And there's a lot of talk in the field about which variables are best to use. I think that's a very interesting conversation to have. Um, in our lab, the approach that we took is basically doing a principal components analysis on all of these actigraphy variables and parsing them out into four main components that represent common indicators that are studied in the field. So sleep duration, sleep timing, sleep variability, both in the duration of sleep and the timing of sleep, and activity. Our activity index is basically getting at how fragmented mom's sleep is. So how much is she awake after sleep onset? How many episodes of five or more minutes was she awake in the night? What's the longest duration of her longest wake episode? All of those variables went into this composite index. And then in this study, what I did is I took those composites and formed a latent construct. So if you see the term general sleep deficit, this represents short sleep, variable sleep, 
and late sleep, meaning late timing of sleep, all measured actigraphically. The one composite that's not included here is that sleep activity index, which we did analyze in that previous study that I looked at, but we didn't analyze here because it didn't link with this latent construct. Then to measure positive parenting, we again formed a latent construct at each age using items from the home scale items inventory, as well as a questionnaire that we developed in our lab. And to show you some sample items, these were completed by the observers. So those research assistants that went into the home, they had a clipboard with them and they were taking notes and filling out questionnaires and they were rating these kinds of things during the bedtime routine. So they were assessing how responsive was mom in terms of like verbal responsivity, how involved was she as the child got ready for bed and how responsive she was in terms of accommodating herself to the child or practicing some reciprocal contributions during the bedtime interaction. Then um, to kind of walk us through our cross-lagged panel model in a step-by-step -step manner, because these can be overwhelming to look at. Um, first, we basically replicated that first study that I went over with you, that higher levels of mom's reports of stress were linked with worse sleep problems, actigraphic measures of sleep problems, and higher levels of sleep problems were linked with less observed positive parenting, um, which was also linked with stress. I just don't have that represented here. Then what we can do in this model is look at the continuity within those constructs across time. Um, so we, we are accounting for their continuity across time. And then we can really get into those questions that I first raised that I wanted to look at. So the first one was examining those links across time between mother's stress and sleep. And what we found is that they're basically inextricably linked in this bi-directional way, which is what we expected that when moms experience worse sleep, they tend to experience higher levels of stress. And when they experience higher levels of stress, they tend to experience worse sleep. So the two feed into each other in this transactional way. The next question of interest was if mother's sleep would predict change in positive parenting across time. So not just is it linked within one time point, but do we really see change in positive parenting even when controlling for prior levels of positive parenting. And indeed we did find that. So higher levels of sleep problems were associated with less positive parenting across time. Now you'll notice we don't see that effect at the 36 to 42 month time points. And the effect here was in the same direction. It just wasn't strong enough. It wasn't statistically significant. Um, I wonder if it's due to some of that sample drop that, that we talked about before. Um, but this I think was an important finding, so it's worth highlighting. And then lastly, I was interested in that mediation effect. So this was the proposed effect that higher levels of stress would predict more sleep problems, would predict less positive parenting. That's what I had theorized. But what we actually found, this is the full model with all effects accounted for here, um, is that more positive parenting at bedtime was associated with fewer sleep problems across time for the mom, which was then associated, we know that sleep and stress were already associated with each other. So the way to interpret this is if moms are more responsive and involved during the bedtime routine, they tend to experience better sleep themselves, which is then associated with less stress across time. So the way that, that we interpreted this is a few things that if you have a mom who's highly responsive and involved during their child's bedtime routine, perhaps those are moms who themselves prioritize sleep, that they, they value sleep, they value sleep for their child and they value sleep for themselves. Potentially they're practicing good sleep hygiene themselves. If they're practicing a good bedtime routine for their child, perhaps they're doing one for themselves as well. And certainly we know from other research from our lab that parents who parent in this positive way help their child have better sleep outcomes demonstrated actigraphically, and that child sleep in this sample is linked with mother sleep. So potentially if your child's sleeping better, that helps you sleep better as well. 
So our goals were to extend that original cross-sectional study from Journal of Family Psychology in this sleep health special issue article um, to accomplish these three aims. But I do think there's some limitations that we want to acknowledge. So um, one that I sort of mentioned at the beginning is that this is a largely homogeneous sample. And I think especially now that I'm working in Indianapolis and I have much more diversity in terms of racial and socioeconomic diversity, I think it's important to mention that this is a relatively less stressed sample potentially than other samples might be. But it's still worth highlighting that we found these links between stress and sleep, even in a relatively homogeneous sample. Another potential limitation is that we were using the six month time scale. A lot happens in a toddler's life and a family's life across six months. So another interesting approach would be to, for example, do some like night before analyses where we look at actigraphy from the night before and predict mother's parenting that next night, which we would be able to do with this data. Of course, all of this research is very focused on mothers, but we know that some families have a father in the picture as well, or another parenting partner. And I think that is a really interesting avenue of research to pursue, both to think about how are father stress and sleep um, linked in ways that might be different than mothers, and how might a parenting partner help buffer some of the stress and sleep effects that mothers have. Um, so I think that's an interesting direction for future research. And lastly, um, our focus on positive parenting, I think is important to mention as a potential limitation that um, we know that negative parenting is also a domain that could be interesting to study. However, we didn't observe much negative parenting in this context. Another thing to highlight is that we know from other research from our lab that positive parenting has positive effects on child sleep. So this is a different study where we found that when parents engaged in these kind of positive behaviors during the bedtime routine that helped induce emotional security in their child, that was linked, for example, with earlier sleep timing. So earlier bedtimes for children based on actigraphy. So I wanted to end there and um, we could pause for, for questions and make sure there's time for our other speakers. Okay, we have a question here. Um, uh, Esther Learkeys has a question. Great talk, Maureen. Uh, you mentioned having child sleep data. If you include child sleep, is the link between positive parenting and maternal sleep still significant? In other words, have you tested child sleep as the mediator slash explanatory mechanism with your data? Thank you. Yes. Yeah, so. Um... One thing I, I thought about mentioning when I was going over my background is Doug hosted an excellent innovation hub meeting back in like January of 2020, I think it might've been. And in that um, innovation hub meeting, some of the work I presented did look at that, that um, same idea of posing child sleep as a mediator. Um, and in an initial draft of this paper for the special issue, I actually included both child sleep and child behavior. Um, some of those like externalizing behavior problems as mediators. And we do see some interesting effects there. Um, it's nuanced and a bit complicated, but um, we certainly have, have thought about that. So basically the idea that maybe mother's parenting predicts child sleep predicts um, mother's sleep. And although it's not as clean as that because the models get um, pretty complicated with all the cross um, associations, it is really interesting. And it was beyond the scope of that present study, but I think more studies to come with that variable included. Okay, we have another question um, from Lin Ying Ji. It says, hello, Dr. McQuillan. Thank you for the wonderful talk. Um, I noticed that in your 2019 maternal stress sleep and parenting study, uh, the number of siblings is also a very strong predictor. Have you considered sibling effects? And what would, you, what would be a good way to incorporate these effects in the models? 
thank you for raising that point. Yeah, the um, when we published that paper, I believe it was a reviewer that felt strongly that we um, account for other children in the home. And I really, really, really appreciate that recommendation because not only could it have effects on the child's sleep, it could have effects on how the bedtime routine unfolds, it could have effects on mom's sleep, it could have effects on mom's way of parenting during the bedtime routine. Like some of those items about involvement where we talk about how involved mom is or how much mom keeps child within view. As a person who did a lot of those observations, I know that some of our moms had a lot of kids and they might need to be going from room to room to room supervising everything. So I think those sibling effects are interesting to at least account for. Um, I do know that in that study, we did find that this sleep variable was more predictive of mother's parenting than the number of siblings she has. So even though number of siblings was predictive, this effect was stronger than that. Um, hopefully that answers your question. Okay. It looks like the same question was submitted twice here. So um, any other questions from our registrants? I do think there's- Oh, here we go, here we go, here's one, yeah. So um, let's see, uh, thank you for your wonderful talk. How do you define positive parenting versus negative parenting? What parenting styles do you recommend? I.e. limit setting with assertive parenting for bedtime routines. Also, how do you consider cultural factors that may influence parenting styles? Oh, excellent question. So my dissertation research was focused entirely on this, um, these topics and I think a lot about different ways that we can break down parenting domains. And one way that you could break it down is into this negative and positive domain. So with positive, we're talking about things like responsiveness and involvement. Another way to think about it is um, to break it down into warmth and control. So if you have a parent, for example, who's highly warm and responsive, but also practicing effective control, that kind of assertive parenting, like the, like the um, audience member mentioned. Um, I think that is definitely a form of parenting that would be considered positive. And then when we talk about negative parenting, I think there's different domains that could be classified as negative. You could think of harsh parenting, harsh or intrusive parenting, which I kind of mentioned, we didn't see that much of that in our study, but you could also think of negative parenting as like ineffectual control. So potentially laxness, for example. Um, so I think all of these parenting domains are very interesting to think about. And in a really comprehensive study, it'd be nice to look at multiple domains of parenting. And then with the cultural factors piece, I think that's very worth mentioning that I know, for example, Dr. Jen Lansford has done excellent research about how parenting varies across cultures and then how differences in those parenting domains are linked with differences in child outcomes, depending on cultural norms and things like that. So excellent points. Here's a question that, uh, uh, what do you see as the implications for sleep policy? Ooh, love that question. So <laughs> sometimes when I hear questions about sleep policy, where my head goes is to stuff about like school start times and things like that for child sleep. But when we zoom out and think about mother sleep, um, a very interesting point is about, for example, when we get into postpartum period and infancy, talking about like maternal leave policies and making sure moms have opportunities to rest, because I think all of this research that we're doing is really showing the power of mother's sleep. For example, if, if in the sleep clinic that I work in, if we're telling moms, oh, you need to practice these positive bedtime routines and help the child feel safe and secure in order to sleep well at night. If our moms are not well rested and they're exhausted and we don't have policies in place that help promote their abilities to get rested, then I think um, we're really doing a disservice to our, to our families. Great. Any questions from our panelists for Dr. McClellan? I did have a quick question um, about your methods, and this might be a joint question for you and Doug. 
Um, but in the work that I've been doing, I've used Doug's methods of video recording um, at bedtime and through the night to get at parenting. And I was interested to see that you did yours live. And I was curious about your thoughts on having a research assistant in the room versus recording and why you chose to do it that way. And yeah, yeah. so I can't necessarily speak to why we chose to do it this way, because to be honest, at the time of us joining, me joining the lab, this protocol was already established. Um, but in terms of how it actually worked or what sorts of effects happen with that observer bias, right? That, that by having an observer in the home, potentially parents changed their behavior, right? We, we expect that they probably did, that, that some parents might've tried to be on their best behavior or really clean up their home or really have the cutest pajamas on their toddler because they knew there were people coming to their house. Um, however, I do think it's important to mention that there's an interesting phenomenon of what parents think is an ideal way of parenting. And some parents would, for example, discipline in a very firm, potentially even harsh way um, because of potentially their ideals about parenting that they think, oh, if I convey that I'm in control and that I'm the boss, that this will look good to the researchers. So there is some element of what do parents see as ideal parenting? And another thing I would mention is that they are parents of toddlers and toddlers are so unpredictable that even if they tried their best to like have everything go smoothly, toddlers are gonna do what toddlers are gonna do. So with us coming in the home, um, I do think we saw a lot of real world interactions, um, especially because we did it at each time point. So. Um, we would go in at 30 months, 36 months, and 42 months. And oftentimes the families were pretty used to us being there. We also technically did two home visits at each uh, time point. I only mentioned our second home visit. The first one we went in and did like a cognitive assessment with the child. Um, so at that point, we would have been in the family's home a total of six times over the course of a year. So I do think that maybe helps in that we were getting to know these families pretty well. Um, but I think the video data is so cool because what we're missing is what happens after the child, the child goes to bed. What if as soon as mom leaves the room, that toddler's following them out and saying, wait, mom, I, I need another glass of water. I need a hug. We're not getting that data. And I think having video data through the whole night, you get to see how the parents are responding to night wakings and that kind of thing. Hey, thank you. Maureen, I have a question. Um, so you mentioned that the sleep activity factor was not part of the CM model. Uh, yep. it's, it's an important factor. So yeah. I was wondering whether you, um, whether you examined it separately in relation to parenting, to positive parenting. Yeah. Thank you. So in that initial study that I mentioned, the one in Journal of Family Psych, um, we did look at sleep activity and found the same effect. So we found that um, higher levels of sleep activity, so more fragmented sleep was associated with less positive parenting above and beyond stress, hours worked, number of kids in the home, maternal age. In this paper, it was really just about um, parsing it down so that it wasn't so overwhelming. Kind of walking through that model was, um, uh, it's a complex model, I would say. So just to parse down the number of findings, we only presented the latent construct factor. So I don't have that data. I could test it with just sleep activity um, and see how the model shakes out. I think that would be a good thing to do, but we didn't do it for this paper. Uh, Maureen, I have one quick question for you about uh, whether or not you considered, since you were in the home, um, looking at co-parenting and whether or not, uh, to what degree were fathers involved in putting right. the kids to bed. Yeah. And uh, we found in some work that we've done that there is an association between co-parenting quality and uh, parent and infant sleep at least. And we, I, I, that's, when you're looking at co-parenting, you're like one degree of freedom away from the actual parent-child relationship, although it's obviously involved. So mm -hmm. I was curious about whether you thought about doing that. Yeah, so I was just flipping through my slides. Um, just to go back to this, this slide about the focus on mothers that I think your question, Doug, about what about co-parenting, I think is so important because what if 
this whole dynamic about how responsive and involved the parent is at bedtime, that could be a very different formula if there's a parenting partner who's helping, right? Or who's maybe dividing and conquering if there's multiple children in the home. Um, so I think that would be really important. We do have some data on that. We've got um, those same questionnaires that our research assistants filled out about the mom. They actually also filled out about the dad if there was a dad in the home. Um, so we have that data, we just have not examined it yet. Um, we also have some other ideas about ways to look at dad's involvement. Um, so I think it's a really important direction for future research, both to better understand dads, to better understand their effect on the family system, and to better understand how that co-parenting dynamic affects mothers functioning. Let's take one more question. There's a, a question that Esther has uh, submitted, and then we probably should move on to Kathy's talk. Um, uh, I had a similar question about sleep activity. I'm wondering about the role of child night wakings in all of this. Can you speculate? Um, so with night wakings, um, in this data that we presented here, I really was just looking at mother sleep. And as we talked about before, I didn't include the sleep activity index. Um, we do have data on child sleep activity and mother sleep activity um, and how those things are linked. We also have data on how much was there a shared sleep space. Um, for example, either mothers and children who were sharing a bed or sharing a room. Um, so I think, I think that's an important question to consider is how much is that affecting mom's sleep? And, and let's get one last question. The question, uh, were, there, were all your parents uh, different gendered parents? Um, so this sample was exclusively female mothers, mothers who identified as female. Um, oh, okay. okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, that was wonderful. Thank you so much, Maureen. Let's, we, uh, for those of you who, ha who have additional questions, well, we should have some time at the end for, um, for additional questions and maybe um, broad questions about, the, the, about, about the, the topic of the webinar, webinar more broadly. But let me take some time to uh, introduce Kathy, Kathy Proper, um, who received her uh, PhD in developmental psychology from Duke in 2006. She is currently an advanced research scientist at the Frank Porter Graham Child Development Institute at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, where she is the director of the Developmental Biobehavioral Core and the co-PI slash program director of the Carolina Consortium on Human Development, which is an NIH-funded T32 training program. Dr. Proper is the current or past PI of multiple NIH-funded grants that focus on predictors of social, emotional, and cognitive development across the first years of life. She is particularly interested in how infant sleep plays a role in this development and how critical experiences early in life might, may contribute to sleep quality, including infant psychophysiological response to stress, parent-child relationships, and prenatal and postnatal environmental risk. Her current NIH-funded project, the Brain and Early Experiences Study, examines the influence of living in poverty on brain and executive functioning development from zero to three, and how infants sleep during that time may alter long-term trajectories for children at risk. Um, and and the, the title of her talk is Parenting and Maternal Reported Sleep Problems Predict School-Aged Aggression and Inattention. Kathy. Thank you so much, uh, first of all, for having me today. I'm really happy to be here, and I feel just so honored to be on a panel with such world-renowned um, leading experts in child sleep. So I'm, I'm really happy to have been invited. Thank you. And thanks all for being here to listen. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about my research on sleep and the importance of parenting, as well as associated cognitive and behavioral outcomes in elementary school. Uh, but before I jump into my research, I first wanted to give you a little background about how I became interested in this area. Um, okay, so this is my firstborn son, Liam. Um, he just turned 15 a few weeks ago. Um, and I'm pretty sure that since the day he was born, I've thought about sleep almost every day. Um, <laughs> it sort of changed my whole understanding of how sleep matters. Um, he was not a great sleeper and he was a very bad sleeper actually. And I found myself in the first couple of years of his life worrying all the time about what I was doing wrong, 
I had friends who seemed to have babies that were sleeping through the night from the first few weeks of life, and I couldn't understand what I was doing incorrectly. Um, I started worrying about, did I eat something that I shouldn't have when I was pregnant? Did I, um, is he sick? And uh, is he always going to be a bad sleeper? So it really consumed me for a couple of years and um, made me realize the importance in day-to-day functioning for our family when he didn't sleep well. But I also worried about his long-term um, kind of development, like how would it affect him in the future? At the same time that he was this age, I was finishing up my PhD in developmental psychology, and I was working on a study, which happens to be the one that I'll be talking about today. It's a 20-year-old study called the Durham Health and Development Study. I was a research assistant um, as a graduate student on this project, and I would go into families' homes or we would have lab visits, and I would we would assess families and children, and then we'd go back and classify those infants as being either um, negative or highly reactive, you know, negative, difficult temperament. And I started to think to myself, depending on the day that you came into my home, you would classify my son as a very different child. So if he had a bad night's sleep, he probably would be one of those negative, difficult babies. Um, but he really wasn't. He was very sweet and easygoing most of the time, um, which really led me to believe that in order to understand any phenomenon throughout development, we need to understand sleep. Um, without taking that into consideration, it's hard to really um, measure things accurately. Um, so this kind of shaped my research trajectory from there. Um, and I became interested in adding sleep into all of my, um, my work. And at the time I was fortunate enough to get a K award and uh, Doug Tatey was my mentor. So I've learned so much from him and um, you'll hear about that throughout as well. So, um, so yeah, now I will jump into the research. Okay, so why does infant and toddler sleep matter? Um, there are obviously many, many reasons why it matters. Um, I'm just gonna talk about a few of them here that I think are of primary importance. Um, one is that it alters learning opportunities. So again, when you think of the short-term effects of poor sleep, day to day, um, you imagine a child who's drowsy and cranky and fussy if they didn't get a good night's sleep, um, how that might affect their relationship with their caregivers the following day. So this might be their parents or it could be their daycare provider or other children um, that maybe are in their class or in their home. Um, if there's a lot of negative reactivity and difficulty engaging, they're missing out on both cognitive learning opportunities. So play with uh, age appropriate toys or having books read to them um, or just observing um, appropriate interactions among others. Um, but they're also missing out on social emotional learning. So playing with other children, learning how to share and cooperate, um, spending quality time with caregivers in a positive state. So, um, so day to day, this really makes a difference in kind of um, their learning opportunities. Um, it also matters for their relationship with caregivers, um, which I think Maureen spoke a lot about as well. So just the evocative effect of having a negative baby. Um, so even a very sensitive and um, caring parent does lose patience over time. If you've got a child who is um, fussy often and negative, and it's compounded by the fact that maybe mom or dad are not getting enough sleep either. So so the evocative effects on caregivers, and again, this, this not only parents, but also in, in daycares or preschools, um, could cause negative caregiving back in return. So the bi-directional relationship over time increases some of these, um, some of the issues that um, maybe uh, wouldn't have been such a big deal had, the, had we um, had better sleep at the start. Uh, so if you're a parent or you've ever had, uh, you know, experience with babies, you might feel this emotion right here, which is just the frustration of not being able to, to get um, baby to calm down and it can lead to impatience and in worst case scenarios, even child abuse, which we also hear about. Um, finally is brain development. Um, so in those first couple of years of life, it's a really critical period for brain development. Um, by two years of age, about... Um, 90% of the brain has, uh, is at adult size. Um, and also in these two years of life, um, they typically babies spend nearly 14 months asleep and 10 months in waking activities. So there's asleep more than they are awake. Um, and I found this uh, quote from Dahl in 1996 to be really interesting. He says, the fact that evolution has favored the brain to spend considerably more time in a state of sleep 
than in all waking activities combined at a time of such rapid neural development suggests that sleep may serve a crucial function in brain development. Um, so I think this first couple of years is really critical. So if you have a baby who's not sleeping well and is having really disrupted sleep or maybe not getting enough sleep, you can see how that would alter brain development and lead to potential long-term problems in cognitive, social, emotional, and behavioral development. And indeed, there are plenty of studies out there. These are just a few examples. There is a lot more that link early sleep problems to later um, issues. So for example, cognitive outcomes, including executive functioning and attention have been found to be related to early sleep problems. Also externalizing outcomes such as impulsivity, poor self-control and aggression, um, and internalizing outcomes like depression, anxiety, and inhibition. So again, these are just a few examples, but there's a lot of literature that really supports this link, which is why I feel it's very important that we understand um, what leads to these problems for some kids. Okay, next, I think that um, what I'm talking about before is kind of a snapshot of sleep. So these critical periods early in life are really important, but it's also important to understand how sleep develops over time. Um, so before six months of age, sleep is not yet consolidated. We see a lot of um, daytime sleep or um, waking at night, but, but after that time period, it starts to improve. So for typical, you know, typically you'd see increased elongated stretches of sleep, consolidation of sleep at nights and fewer night wakings. Um, but this doesn't happen for all children. For some children, this happens slower. And for some, you know, takes years, if at all, and problems continue to worsen. Um, so I think it's really important that we understand those trajectories and for who are the kids um, who are not improving and getting um, these kind of consolidation at night and uh, fewer night wakings. There are a lot of potential predictors of these trajectories. Um, that folks have looked at, that we're looking at now, um, including parenting behaviors, which I'll talk more about, maternal mental health. So again, this could also be provoked by having uh, not enough sleep and a difficult child, but when you've got a mother who's, who's depressed or anxious, that could uh, worsen some of these problems over time. Um, the physical environment, so if you've got room sharing and bed sharing or lots of people sharing one home, that could increase noise levels, that could be um, something as simple as the temperature in, in the house or um, neighborhood violence and stress. Uh, there's a lot of things that could cause stress during the, um, in the home and then the bedtime routine. Um, also child psychological or physiological function, there could be underlying neurodevelopmental issues and temperament. So I'm just gonna jump into the current study and our hypotheses. Um, I do wanna start by saying that this is secondary data analysis of a study that has been around for 20 years, as I mentioned. Um, so it is not exactly ideal. I would not have chosen to use a self-report measure of sleep. Um, and in the current studies I'm doing and future studies I'll talk about soon, um, we will be using more objective measurement, but, but we do have the CBCL um, for this study. And so I'm gonna use that that's why I call it maternal reported sleep problems rather than just sleep problems. Um, so our first hypothesis is that uh, decreases in maternal perception of sleep problems via the CBCL from 18 to 84 months of age and significant between person variability in the rate of change. So we expect to see that. Um, so this is just kind of, again, replicating um, work that's already been done to see if we see these changes over time. Uh, we expect that maternal parenting behavior at six months of age will predict infant sleep problems at 18 months of age, which is our intercept, as well as change in sleep problems from 18 to 84 months of age, which is our slope. Uh, we thought that sleep problems at 18 months, as well as their change over time, will predict behaviors that are reported by teachers in the early elementary classroom. Um, we chose to specifically look at inattention and aggression for this for several reasons. One, we see this um, across kids, not just clinically diagnosed children, but most kids will show some form or you can find forms of inattention or aggression. Um, so in a community sample, this is something that will exist. Um, these can be observed in the classroom, so therefore teachers can report on them. Um, so it's something that we can ask about and expect to find some variability. Um, and these are both very important for school success. So these are important outcomes that we think um, will matter for future um, achievement. 
And um, we wondered whether sleep trajectories would mediate the relationship between parenting and teacher reported child outcomes. So, um, so again, what is the mechanism? And we were um, thinking it may be sleep trajectories. Okay. So our sample, as I mentioned, is from the Durham Child Health and Development Study. The study began with a sample of 206 families. Um, we have 164 in this sample because these are the um, families that had full data across all of our time points. 51% uh, were black, 47% were male, um, and these are full-term healthy infants and their caregivers. Um, we had a stratified sampling procedure for recruitment, which means that there were four cells in our sample. We had low-income white, low-income black, high-income white, high-income black cells. So we tried to disentangle race from SES. Um, and we um, uh, were able to use a multi-informant approach here because of our observational data. And as Maureen talked about, we have research assistant observational data. We also have caregiver report and we have teacher reports. So again, although the self-report might not have been our first choice, I like that we've got various reporters, which really reduces same source bias and same context bias. Um, we did data collection at many time points, but for this current study, I'm gonna talk about six, 18, 24, 30, 36, 60, and 84 months of age. Um, so we saw them from infancy. I mean, we also did a three month visit. I'm not gonna talk about here, but from the very start of life through third grade. So um, we do have a lot of data, which is I think novel. Okay. Um, so at six months, we measured parenting behavior. And again, I feel like Maureen, you did a great introduction for me here because um, this was similar. We were interested in the harsh intrusive parenting that you spoke about as well as sensitive parenting. Um, so we used the NICHD study of early child care free play interaction where we instructed moms to interact as you normally would with your baby for about 10 minutes. Um, and we video recorded these 10 minute interactions, brought them back to the lab, research assistants, um, coded them. It took years to get our folks reliable. So this is, this is a really good coding system. Um, and we had multiple subscales that they coded, which included parental sensitivity, intrusiveness, detachment, stimulation of development, positive regard, negative regard, and animation. And using factor analyses, this came to two composite variables, which are sensitive parenting and harsh intrusive parenting. So those are the two composites we use for the rest of our analyses. Um, and this, these have also been found in many, many studies for years. Um, so they're a pretty um, reliable and strong measure of parenting. Okay. So for sleep, as I said, uh, we use the child behavior checklist. Um, we use the appropriate age um, measure for each. So our 18 through 60 months had the 1.5 to 5 and 84 months we used the older CBCL. Um, we were focused on the child sleep problem subscale that had seven questions. Um, some examples are a child has trouble getting to sleep or wakes often. I'll talk more about the CBCL in a bit and some of the limitations, but um, another question is my child sleeps worse or better than other children. So um, so these were the, the questions we used to create a sleep problem score. Um, our score, um, the higher the score, the more severe the sleep problems. Okay. And finally, our measure of inattention and aggression in the classroom. Um, as I mentioned, we got teacher reports. So we had as um, teachers fill out questionnaires about each child. Um, so we had their, their kindergarten teacher and their second grade teacher do this. Um, 10 items made up the inattention scale, things like fails to finish, cannot sit still, difficulty following direction. And we had an aggression scale, which was disobedient in school, threatens and argues, for example. Um, we averaged the two together to kind of um, reduce teacher bias and have a more stable measure and higher scores uh, equal more severe problems. Okay. So this table summarizes our full structural equation model. I will walk you through the results in a moment, um, but here you can see that our significant effects are highlighted in red and our marginally significant effects are highlighted in green. Um, at the top, we tested the direct effects of our covariates. So we use sex, race, gestational age, and income to needs as our covariates. And we did find that income to needs was significantly associated with attention problems in elementary school. We also tested the direct effect of parenting behavior at six months on both sleep and behavioral outcomes. 
Um, and next, we looked at sleep problems at 18 months, our, our intercept, and slope over time as predictors of elementary behavioral outcomes. And finally, we examined sleep as a mediator of the relationship between parenting and those elementary school outcomes. Um, so our findings, I'm gonna walk through them and kind of interpret them through here um, one at a time. Um, so as expected, we did find an overall decrease in reported sleep problems over time, um, as has been reported in the literature. Um, we also expected that there would be significant variation across infants in their intercept and slope, and there was, so we do see differences across kids. Um, and we observed that children who started with higher levels of reported sleep problems at 18 months showed a steeper decrease in these problems over time. And that is not surprising, of course, because when you start with more problems, it's easier to go down <laughs> than if you start with less problems and you hit a floor effect. So um, that did not surprise us. Um, okay. Our second hypothesis, um, we did see evidence as hypothesized that harsh intrusive parenting predicted more sleep problems at 18 months of age. So this was really interesting. Um, we um, have a couple of thoughts about this finding. Um, sensitive parenting trended in this direction uh, or the direction of fewer sleep problems, um, but it did not reach significance and neither parenting behavior predicted the slope. Um, so several thoughts. Um, first, the studies have found that it's essential for infants to have a sense of physical and emotional security from caregivers to get high quality sleep. Um, it's possible that infants who have negative or harsh parents do not feel this sense of security or safety or comfort, and it might make it harder for them to get a good night's sleep. Um, so that might be where this link is coming from. Although we expected to see an effective maternal sensitivity as well, this was not the case. Um, and it may be that this is just an issue of our sample size and power, but it could be that harsh intrusive parenting does indeed have a different effect than sensitive parenting on sleep. There's a lot of evidence in the literature that supports the link between this style of parenting and, and children who are less well-regulated, um, which leads to behavior problems. We know that children who are less regulated also have a decreased ability to put themselves to sleep and to stay asleep since they're not able to self-soothe as easily. So it could be that um, that may be what's going on. It also could be that the measure of sensitivity that we used, which was a general measure and happened during the daytime, may not be specific enough. Um, and it would be better to, and this is our plan for the future, and we've started working on this in my current studies, um, to use Doug's measures of emotional availability at bedtime and through the night. So we're getting a more spe sleep specific context of maternal sensitivity rather than a more generalized one. And it's happening at night where parents may be more stressed. Um, so when we have them do this 10 minute free play, although we do see a lot of variation, it might be easier because you're playing a game, you're, it's, everyone's maybe well rested and it's not that stressful. But if you put a mother in the same situation when baby is exhausted and mom is exhausted, um, her um, kind of abilities to remain sensitive may, may change as well. And so while we measured parenting only at six months of age, it's also the case that this is quite stable over the first couple of years of life. So it's likely that these same parents are being negative or harsh at 18 months of age as well. And so we might be seeing the concurrent effects rather than kind of the early predictors of this parenting style. Um, and again, 18 month olds may be showing new sort of behaviors that are difficult. So when you've got more um, higher number of words in your vocabulary, um, it's easier to be defiant at bedtime and not wanna to go to sleep. They're able to climb out of their cribs in some cases. So this becomes more difficult, which makes a negative parent likely uh, more negative perhaps. Um, and so it could be that this parenting style is being compounded over time as developmental stages progress. And although we did see a normative decline in sleep problems from 18 to 84 months, parenting did not predict this slope. Um, this is again, not all that surprising because parenting in, our, in this current study was only measured once and it was measured about a year before the sleep uh, measurement began. Um, so there are likely many other unmeasured variables at play here, um, including this kind of sleep specific measurement we were talking about, chaos in the home, developmental changes in both environments and practices in, um, at sleep and bedtime. Um, so it, it 
it isn't that surprising. Um, and so future studies, we would love to actually measure parenting across each of these same time points to kind of look at that trajectory as well and how it affects the sleep um, development. Our third hypothesis, um, we did find that sleep at 18 months of age predicted aggressive behavior in the classroom years later as reported by teachers, while the slope or change over time did not predict these outcomes. So changes in sleep over time did marginally predict attention, but it was not, it also did not reach significant. Um, this finding is consistent with prior research that has found associations between early sleep problems and later behavioral problems. So um, this is what we did expect. Um, so this finding suggests that early sleep problems that occur within the critical period of those first two years may disrupt neurodevelopment. Um, as I spoke about earlier, it's a critical period for brain growth. So this might lead to difficulty with self-regulation that might under, undermine future ability to regulate stress and behavior. Um, there are, again, many findings. Uh, Sade and colleagues, as well as Dahl and others have found this link between sleep problems and aggression and suggest that it might be the frequent sleep disruptions on early brain growth that might impair later child regulatory abilities. In addition, it's important to remember that this kind of bi-directional relationship between sleep and parenting is really important here. So as we discussed earlier, sleep problems and resulting child behavior might elicit more negative responses from caregivers, or it could increase psychological distress leading to more depression and, or anxiety in parents. So the parenting behaviors that follow might exert kind of this evocative biopsychosocial effect on the child, leading to subsequent changes in their behavior, including aggression. Finally, we did not find evidence that sleep trajectories had indirect effects on the relationship between parenting and child outcomes in the classroom. Um, it could very well be the case that this is not a driving force here, as there are many other processes that might be mediating this relationship, but it is also possible that our lack of findings might be related to our measure of sleep, as I've spoken about. While the CBCL provides us with a really good measure of mom's perception of child sleep, which is very useful when we're thinking about family functioning and influences on parenting, it is not the best measure of actual sleep. Um, so as children get older, we know that their report of their, their own sleep with the CBCL does not correlate with mother report. So we know that this report is not necessarily accurate. Um, it also could be that families differ in what they consider to be problematic sleep. So some families might think this is a problem where others don't. Um, so future studies, um, including ones that we're, we're working on now, should include measurement that's better suited to assess objective metrics of sleep. So actigraphy and videography, uh, video somnography. Uh, so to summarize the findings, there is an overall decrease in maternal reported sleep problems from 18 to 84 months. Maternal harsh intrusive parenting at six months did predict maternal reported sleep problems at 18 months. And sleep problems reported by mothers at 18 months predicted later aggressive behaviors. So those were our three main takeaway messages. Um, a few limitations in future directions. As I have continued to say, and um, again, this is one of the pitfalls of having a really wonderful, rich data set that's longitudinal and has wonderful measurement of most things, but may not have the perfect um, assessment of the thing that we're looking for. So the CBCL is the one thing about the study that, you know, if we could do it again, we would um, improve that. So there's, again, for some families, there's no reference point. So if you say my child sleeps better or worse than others, what does that mean? That probably differs quite a bit across families. Um, parents don't always know what's happening. And also it covers a six month period. It asks for how did these things look over the past six months, which is a quite a large span of time, especially at this age when things change very quickly from week to week or month to month. Um, so it's, it is, you know, a bit broad. Um, but the strengths are that we were able to get a lot of repeated measures. So it's easy to do questionnaires. So we were able to do it a lot more frequently than if we were doing some other objective measurements. Um, it's less expensive. So you know, lots of uh, studies can include these. Um, and it might be more acceptable to families than having someone come in and video record while you, you while you sleep <laughs> with your child, um, as well as EEG or actigraphy, just to maybe more burdensome. Um, so in the future, we want to replicate these findings using a multi-method approach of actigraphy, daily diary, and video somnography. Um, I was going to show a couple of examples of what we're doing now. Um, 
my my timer did not work when I started it, so I'm not sure how much time I have left. Um, but if I have just a couple more minutes, yeah, it's okay. Right, thanks. Um, okay, so for those of you who've not seen actigraphy data, I just wanted to show a couple of examples because I think it really just drives home how useful this could be as a measure. Um, this is an example of an actigraph. Um, the blue areas are indicate sleep, um, and the white areas are when child is awake. Um, and each line represents a different day. So you can see here, this is a child who seems to be sleeping pretty well. They're going to bed at a decent hour, um, maybe waking up once or twice, and then um, going back to sleep. And then they have nap times. You know, you can see in the blue is a nap time. So, so this seems to be a pretty um, good sleeper. And that's the act to watch that we can we put on um, infants' ankles. Um, but here's an example of a poor sleeper. And I think this just really illustrates the difference. So um, in this case, you see, and this is from um, my current, uh, more recent study called the Neonatal and Pediatric Sleep Study, where we did this um, for seven days on 120 infants. And this was an example of a baby who sleeps for an hour or two, wakes up, sleeps for an hour or two and wakes up. Um, naps are kind of all over the place. And then we had some missing data in the middle. Um, but so I think it just, um, you know, you see, I wonder about a mom reporting on this, whether or not, you know, we might, I'm sure she'd report that there's a lot of wakes, but you wouldn't get the intricacies that you can get from actigraphy. So we're excited to be using that. Um, we do a daily diary for seven days and nights where we call mom in the morning so that she's fresh and can remember what happened the night before. Um, so we ask about things like nap times, but also we can get more information about what did you do at bedtime with your baby? Who else was involved? Was it just you? Was dad involved? Was there someone else there? Um, so we can get a bit more detail than you can get from an act to watch alone. Um, and then this is the um, procedure that we implemented following uh, or implemented following Doug Tatey's work, which has been really exciting, um, where we actually film bedtime and keep filming through the night. And we have four cameras up where we um, have mom's bed, baby's bed, hallway, anywhere that families thought that the baby might be while they're sleeping. So we can get at um, infant state and we do code this all through the night. Um, so their state, we get at whether or not they have physical contact with mom or other caregivers. Where are they sleeping? Are they in their own room or their parents' room or their parents' bed? Did parents have to make an intervention and for what purpose? Um, uh, yeah, so, so that's been really helpful for us to really get a sense of what's going on and what parenting behavior looks like during those stressful moments at bedtime and through the night. Um, and finally, these are just a few examples of seeing how the different sleep locations may make a difference in child sleep. So in this example, it's kind of hard to see, but mom has one baby laying on her chest and there's a toddler sleeping right next to her. Um, and then as the night goes on, baby gets moved to the foot of her bed and the toddler's still right next to her. Um, and you can imagine how these things affect sleep for these kids, you know, whether or not they're, the toddler might wake up and wake up the baby or mom's moving or, um, so it's more than just parenting behavior, but actually their sleep locations. And um, we see a lot of differences. We see moms who are sleeping with babies on couches and moms who are sleeping with babies on the floor. Um, so our future studies will be looking at all of these things to get a better context of sleep. So we're not just getting kind of the overarching um, generalized parenting, but really sleep specific context um, and how that may affect um, sleep trajectories. So special thanks to the Durham Child Health and Development Investigators, Martha Cox, Steve Resnick, and Peter Ornstein, um, my colleagues and grad students and postdocs who have helped with this work and are helping collect data for the next study. Um, and our funders at NSF. Thanks very much. Okay. Thank you, Kathy. Uh, we have already one question from uh, Jack Wells, who's asking, actigraphy is great, but it's very expensive. For studying parents, all children sleep, what are the panel's thoughts about using wearable technology such as Fitbits, uh, et cetera? So yeah, I would love to also. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I would love to also hear the rest of the panel's thoughts on this. Um, I've been to several workshops at various conferences where this conversation has been had. Um, and I think the overarching 
decision is that not that these more commercially available technologies are just not as precise. And so you can't get at some of the detail that you can with actigraphy. Um, so I have never tried to do that, um, but it is true. There are lots out there right now. And, um, and but, but I don't know, I don't have any colleagues who are using them because I think once they've tried, it's been hard to get at the kind of um, precise data that we get with actigraphy. But I'd be curious to hear other people's thoughts on that as well. Yeah, as far, far as I know, none of these commercials have been uh, validated against polysomnography or uh, video recordings. Uh, we are uh, doing a validation study of the Fitbit uh, device, um, and uh, but I don't have the findings yet, so I won't comment on that. Um, I, I think a major problem is that as far as I know, you cannot get the algorithms uh, that uh, these commercials are based on. Uh, so it's really difficult to understand what they are actually measuring. Yeah, I, I was also um, sort of informed uh, that um, the, the commercial um, devices like Fitbits and whatnot have their firmware updated maybe every six months or whatever. So there's, there's that concern in terms of whether or not you're you're evaluating something in a consistent manner with the same firmware every single time or whether you have to worry about those upgrades and those commercial devices. Uh, but I actually had an NIH um, program director ask me why, why I, I wasn't proposing to use Fitbits uh, as opposed to uh, Actigraphs because they're so much less expensive. Uh, and I had to sort of justify why the, why the uh, uh, Actigraphs that we were using were the preferred scientific um, Way, way of doing it. Yeah. But I, I don't know, you know, I'm not sure if the Fitbits are getting any better. I'm not really sure how, you know, where, where we are now with that. Mm -hmm. Sorry. So Jeff Devine writes, and that's correct, that many commercial sleep trackers have been validated against polysomnography, but in adults. So yeah, I just want to say that I, I was referring to children and not to adults. That's, that's yeah. I also think there's a lot of interesting technology coming out that again, I don't know if it's being used yet, but we've been looking into, which are uh, mattress pads that you can put in the crib that have sensors so that that gets at. Um, and again, I don't know that that would be much cheaper, um, but another way of kind of getting at movement through the night, um, as well as things like temperature. Um, and um, what was the other one I was thinking of? Um, just, yeah, onesies that have sensors built in. So we've been working with folks at the Research Triangle Institute and trying to come up with technologies that are more wearable. Um, it doesn't solve the problem of being cheaper, though. I think they're still going to be quite expensive, but you can get a lot more with some of these, including heart rate variability, um, some skin response stuff, so parasympathetic and sympathetic nervous system activity. Um, so I think there's some cool wearables on the way, but, but it is hard if you want to do um, a large sample, it can get expensive. And we send our devices home with families. I mean, everyone does. Um, so it's seven days. And so if you have multiple families, you either have to have multiple in use at the same time or time it correctly and things get lost. We've had families who just thought they were disposable and threw them out. And so, I mean, there's definitely a lot of risk. Yeah, I think these days there's so many disposable things. And they were like, I just thought I was supposed to throw it out. So <laughs> they, we went garbage <laughs> diving that day, but yeah. What are full we, we have in the chat? A command that in sleep health, uh, or who is writing in sleep health, we are moving away from validations as an overstatement and preferring systematic performance evaluations uh, that allows researchers to decide on devices, uh, wearables, uh, algorithms for themselves. Look for special articles soon. Okay. Great. Looking forward to that. That's exciting, yeah. <laughs> Leah, did you see that we've got a question in the chat from Eve about um, actigraphy? Do you want me uh, to read it out? Uh, so yeah, yeah. yeah, I see a question from Leah Gilbert. 
Do I miss something else? Thank you. Yeah, this one, this one's in the general chat, so I just thought I'd highlight it so that we don't miss it in the questions and answers. But um, she's asking for everybody um, for all the researchers using dactigraphy. Do you, how do you evaluate bedtime? Do you use the time reported in the sleep diary or automatic detection from the actigraphy program? I'd like to say that, uh, answer that first, and then I'd like to hear others. But, and this is something that Doug and I have talked about because um, I was really excited after hearing about Doug's work. Um, it sounded like it would be pretty clear when bedtime was starting. So there'd be maybe a bedtime routine, like lights go off, maybe there's some singing. So bedtime starts. And if we're video recording, we would know when that is. Um, but in my current sample, which is um, the NAP study that I mentioned earlier, um, it may be cultural differences, we're trying to understand this now, but um, it's a fully African-American sample. Um, we are not seeing bedtime routines that much. So often there's, I think as Maureen mentioned, it's hanging out on the couch, having some dinner, and then suddenly baby's asleep and they're put in the crib. And so we were having a lot of trouble figuring out how do we, what's bedtime? Like, how do we call it bedtime? Um, so for us, we started doing just a standard time. We'd start the actigraphy at 6.30 each day and we would record. Um, and then when baby's eyes were closed, we went backwards by like 20 minutes to say that this was kind of like the bedtime, you know, right 20 minutes before they fell asleep. And so we use sleep diary, but we also used our video recordings for that um, because it is kind of tough to come up with an objective idea of, okay, this is, you know, bedtime or sleep. So, so we use all three to get our, um, to make that decision. Um, yeah, just to add to that, uh, we, 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 um, we rely on our sleep diaries, which we give to parents every morning uh, to, I and mean, we ask questions like, okay, when we're, if you're, if you're asking about children for when were lights out, when were lights turned out uh, and uh, about what time do you think your baby, your child actually fell asleep? Um, and, uh, you know, we, uh, we, we cross check that against the actigraph record to see whether or not there is some correspondence between the two. Many, many, many times there is. There is correspondence. It may not be exactly the same time, but it's close. If it's close, we'll take the actigraph record uh, as the start of, of sleep time. And, uh, you know, and we'll still use the lights out time so that we can um, measure or, or develop a, a, a measure of sleep latency on sleep, uh, sleep onset latency, which we have found to be a, a really important uh, predictor of uh, various things. Um, sometimes that they don't, they don't uh, concord, uh, not often, but sometimes they do, uh, they don't rather. And in that case, we tend to rely on the actigraph record because that's the more objective of the two. So it's not a perfect system, but uh, we don't rely just on actigraphy alone. Uh, we, we try to combine that with, uh, with additional input from the parent, mm -hmm. uh, so. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, we do the same, and uh, I'll just add that uh, we use parental reports for bedtime and actigraphy for sleep onset, um, and we can use it, and then we define sleep onset as the time after which we can identify 15 minutes of continuous sleep. That's our criteria. I think in, in our lab, um, we definitely have that kind of conversation about the difference between bedtime or downtime, like when the child is put down to go to sleep versus when the parent thinks the child is asleep. Um, we ran into some interesting things about parents who would put their child to bed with like a TV show on and then leave the room and not necessarily know when the child fell asleep. So actigraphy is so helpful in determining like what we would call true sleep onset time based on actigraphic determination. And I know earlier I showed, um, oh, I was gonna share that screen, but anyways, I showed that um, table of the actigraphy variables that went into our composite and that sleep timing variable that, that I referenced for us, um, well, I'll share. Um, for us, that is a composite of average time of mid sleep. So a lot of you probably know that the midpoint of sleep is, is commonly referenced when people talk about sleep timing. And then also the average time of sleep onset and then average bedtime. And when we refer to bedtime, that's parent reported bedtime on the sleep diary. 
Um, so down here it says bedtime variable was based on mother report of time in bed on the daily diary. Um, so it's a great question because obviously there's a lot of nuance in how we measure that. Okay, so um, go on with the questions. Leah Gilbert, Gilbert asks, uh, thank you to the presenters today for these impressive studies. I'm wondering which self-reported measures would you recommend to assess the sleep of three months old infants? That's a great question. I, um, three months, yeah, I've, I've not, I'm, I will open this up to the panel. I've not done it that at three months. We have um, video recordings, but we've not asked moms to self-report. Um, we have sleep practices questionnaires later, yeah. Um, yeah. So one question I would have for, for Leah is whether she has the uh, ability to get multiple assessments across multiple days. And if she does, uh, a sleep diary is a self-report measure. Mm -hmm. And so you can ask from a day-to-day-to-day -to -day -to -day basis, um, you know, bedtime, uh, wake times, uh, uh, overall duration of, of, of the sleep period, et cetera. And it becomes a much more, I think, a, a accurate, potentially accurate measure than just using a questionnaire that may ask more generically what might be going on. And so I always tend to recommend if you have a choice between diaries versus a questionnaire for self report measure, if you can do diaries, um, I always recommend that. But I, you may not, you may not be able to do that. So the diaries, I mean, we, we do it by calling each morning and I think you do as well. I think that's why, um, actually leaving reports in the home for like that won't work because parents don't often fill it out until the last day of the week and then they fill out the whole thing and it's inaccurate um it's thinking about starting to try to use ema and kind of sending pings for, for via uh, smartphone um so right now we're just calling each morning is that kind of still the procedure that everyone's using for daily diaries yeah yeah that's how we do it mm -hmm. We divide it between the evening and the morning, so we ask them to fill in part of the diary in the evening, asking about all what happens in the evening around bedtime, and then they fill in the morning diary, asking about what happened during the night. Maybe it's a little bit more. Um, I know with um, Dr. Honecker, um, we use like REDCap a lot, and REDCap has a, a way to administer surveys via text message. So that'd be one way to do sleep logs, like send a text to moms to fill out a sleep log. And then another thing I wanted to mention, this is a really, really blurry image, but this is the infant sleep questionnaire that I learned about from Jody Mendel. It's kind of blurry, but it talks about like, how long does it take your um, take to settle your baby? How many times a week do you have problems settling him? Um, waking up at night? Do you think your baby has a sleep problem? So if you wanted that more like zoomed out kind of snapshot as opposed to a daily sleep diary, that was one measure that quickly came to mind for me. Mm -hmm. This is actually the revised and extended brief infant sleep questionnaire. Okay, thank you. <laughs> um, and, and it has many questions, I think really covering all what you can uh, ask about sleep. So. And it's good also for uh, really uh, young infants. So for three months old infants, it can work as well. Um, Tom is asking, do Tom, is this Tom Anders with us here? I was wondering which. Uh, so do cameras in so many rooms pre-select for uh, families who are prone to be on camera? That's a great question. I mean, we definitely had families who said no once they heard about that. But I would say that most of our families who called in, um, to, you know, to, who were interested in the study, who didn't know about the cameras, um, when we told them, didn't, didn't withdraw. Um, yeah. So I feel as though we got the families that were planning to be part of the study either way, and that we did lose a few, but I would say it was surprisingly few. Um, yeah, that's, at that's that point, thing. you're just so used to being observed when you yeah. just had a baby that... Yeah, just want to echo that. But that, that pretty much, uh, you know, it, it, they find out about the cameras after, kind of after the fact. Well, you, you know, it's not. I mean, and and they have the option of saying no. And uh, we had very few families say no. Um, it's one night. We we try not to be. If it's multiple nights, I could see where you might lose people because it, it could be a, a rather um, 
the, the subject burden might be pretty heavy. But most families that we've done for this, and we've done it with three different studies now, don't seem to have too much of a problem with it. And, and they have the option. They have the option of turning the cameras off if they want. So, yeah. Yeah, we have a we have a similar system that that they can turn the cameras off whenever they want to. But um, uh, the thing that they most want to know is who's going to see the videos. And I think when they're reassured that it's only the research team that are going to see the videos, and then they'll be erased right. uh, or disposed of, you know, securely, they're usually quite happy with that. And it is really um, quite, I was, I will say, surprised because a lot of parents' families are co-sleeping still. So we're filming the parents in their bedroom sleeping mm -hmm. as well. Um, and we were planning to get a lot of pushback on that, but um, but we didn't. And Doug had told me that he did not have troubles either. And um, it really was for the most yeah, part. I, I, I was told you'll never be able to do this. They'll never let you do it. Yeah. And yeah, that no, was that's not true. Not yeah, true at all. Not true. Not true. <laughs> we filmed. Hundreds of co-sleeping families. Yeah. And now, I, I mean, I, I, if there's there's a, I'd love to do this these, these kinds of things in a, a country where co-sleeping is much more normative, such as Japan or, um, and I was told, well, you'll, they'll never let you do it. I'm hearing the same thing. They'll never, you know, and I'm going, oh, that's mm -hmm. oh, what I heard back here, and that wasn't true. <laughs> <laughs> so. Um. You have time for a few more questions, right? Well, we have till noon, so yeah. <laughs> uh, Fiona? Yeah, well, you are. <laughs> oh, that's right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> how, how myopic of me, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Fiona is asking, I'm really interested in strategies for mothers to get sufficient sleep, particularly considering the importance of breastfeeding. Well, that one sounds like it's a bit up my street, really, doesn't it? So um, I'll, I'll tackle that one. And, you know, I mean, I think probably at what I talked about in my introduction, kind of, you can predict what I'm going to say. Um, but um, in, in certainly in our studies, the vast majority of mums um, who are breastfeeding end up bringing their baby into bed with them at some point, you know, for some of the night or some nights a week, et cetera. And that is how they manage um, to combine sleep and frequent breastfeeding. Um, so it's, uh, it's one of those topics that people sometimes find difficult to talk about, especially when safe sleep guidelines kind of are, are opposed to mums bringing their babies into bed. But I think our research has shown that it's one of those things that we have to talk to parents about because it happens so frequently and uh, particularly with breastfeeding mums. Uh, other people share my views, please go ahead and <laughs> contradict if you would like. So, move to the next question. Um, Jack Pelz is asking, what do you know? Uh, what do you notice about the sleep environments of infants, young children? Uh, have you noticed any differences between the environments of good versus poor sleepers? I guess this is a question for you, Kathy. Well, I can give you my thoughts. I think Doug, you look like you have thoughts too, but um, yeah, well, as I mentioned, um, we've, we've done a couple of analyses and have some papers out about um, kind of the difference in uh, lower income homes and some of the environments that are created, um, which include kind of overcrowding. So if you've got um, multiple people sharing a bed or a room and then noise level. And so our uh, work so far has shown that um, we actually use census data and um, tracked neighborhoods and found that even um, the neighborhood that families live in might affect infant sleep. Um, yeah. And um, we think it's because of the higher stress levels, perhaps because there's um, more violence in those neighborhoods. There's, again, more volume. Some of our families live in urban settings, so that might be different if you're thinking of rural poverty. Um, but there is kind of the physical kind of noise and um, comfort level. But also we, we spoke about how it likely is coming through parenting stress and um, whether or not it's the environment or um, the financial stress in general. But um, so, so those are the kinds of differences that we've seen, just um, physical environment, but that relates obviously to the bigger picture. Um, so, yeah. yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, we're I just uh, just uh, uh, piggybacking onto that. I mean, we're we're finding that uh, household chaos and uh, household uh, disorganization is a pretty strong predictor of of child sleep, and we we've seen this now in at least two studies coming out of my lab. Uh, you know, Jody Mendel's done done some really interesting work on uh, bedtime routines and how they predict better sleep in kids. I mean. Um, if you can, um, it, 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 it appears, uh, it, it's a pretty strongly replicable finding that environments that are predictable, that uh, help children downregulate uh, there, where there's, there's routine, um, bedtimes before 9 p.m., et cetera, et cetera, we're finding that that is uh, much more predictive of better sleep than, the, than uh, um, environments that are chaotic, unpredictable. Uh, and this is also the case for parents' sleep as well. So. Uh, I think a big part of this, and and you know, th this is something that is potentially modifiable. I think uh, is uh, you know helping parents develop routines um, and more predictable environments to help their children uh, sleep better and also themselves sleep better. Yeah, I I just to jump in, I um, totally agree. I know we we obviously used chaos in in this study that I went over um, and found that it was linked with mother sleep. Um, across time. And I know that earlier in the chat, Caitlin, um, who works with you, Doug, uh, reached out and asked about my thoughts on chaos because back in 2019 at SRCD, I gave a talk about chaos and sleep. Um, and I wanted to give a shameless plug about a recent paper from our lab. Um, this one is from my colleague, uh, Caroline Hoyniak, who's at Washington University now. Um, it just got published in Journal of Family Psychology, so it's like not even out yet. Um, but what they did is they looked at child sleep outcomes. These are all actigraphy indices. And then this is the child sleep habits questionnaire. So mom's report there. And she used machine learning to look at different factors of the home environment that would predict um, these sleep outcomes to really weigh like which were the most predictive. And our, our good old friend Home Chaos did come out as one of the strongest predictors of child sleep timing. So um, whether or not you shared a room with an adult was predictive, how disorganized the home was, and that was based on our observer ratings. Um, the household size, so like the number of people in the home, the sleep space quality, which was based on observer report, um, whether or not they bed shared, and then here's chaos as a predictor. So she put in a lot of indicators and then used machine learning to figure out like which ones were the strongest. Mm -hmm. So for child sleep timing, chaos is playing a big role. So I think um, we're all kind of in. This is one of the, This looks like it's going to be a very important paper. I know I'm really excited about it. So I was this, glad. This to... is really great. So thank you for the yeah. shameless plug. <laughs> yeah. yeah. We have we have a couple of minutes. Um, uh, sh should we, we uh, maybe uh, uh, pick one last question and then uh, maybe some? I, I just have a, some closing remarks and then I think we're we're done in a few minutes. So. Um, wow. <laughs> okay. Do you want to help me to pick one up? And uh... I would just choose. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't want to do that. <laughs> there are some good, good questions here. So, there's a, there's a, well, there's a, yeah. We could also uh, answer it on the chat while you're doing your closing remarks. <laughs> uh, we, we could do that, I guess. I, I I'm guess. Just worrying uh, about timing. I don't know if it closes. Yeah, yeah me too. I, you know, um, just a, one, one comment that I wanted to make about. Uh, I, I think you know. So Maureen's work on uh, parent on uh, sleep and parenting. Uh, overlaps a lot with what we've been looking at too. And uh, I wanted to mention um, that um, we have a study that is in press, or maybe it's already out in Journal of Family Psych, where we looked at two measures of parenting in relation to uh, uh, maternal sleep. One measure was during the day and it was free play and it was more structured, but it was in the home. And the other was bedtime parenting. And interestingly, we found that uh, poor sleep in the mother did not predict daytime parenting. Okay, it did not predict free play, uh, you know, for the free, free play with the baby, but it did predict bedtime parenting. Now, to me, that makes perfect sense because by the time a, if a mother doesn't sleep well or a parent doesn't sleep well, you know, you, you have a cup of coffee in the morning, you're feeling okay during the day, it's structured, it's a structured setting, you know, you're not necessarily going to see an impact of sleep on parenting quality at that point in time. But when you're putting their child to bed and you've had the entire day for, they, for, the, for that sleep deficit to wear on you, that's when you begin to see the deficits. 
you know. And I just wanted to say that to, to the extent that we're studying the family system, looking at contextual features and timing features in terms of when to study parenting and other uh, relationships within the family might be really important to take into consideration. We tend to give parenting short shrift, I think, if you're just looking at it in a structured situation during the day or something. And so many studies have done that successfully. I'm not saying that they haven't always been successful because they have. But if you're looking at naturalistic observation, which I, I'm a big believer in, uh, taking time of day into consideration is really important, I think. And so I just wanted to mention that because I think it's I think it relates to the, the great work that Maureen has been doing. And I think it relates more more broadly to the the, the the topic of trying to understand how contextual features and the family system sort of interact um, in um, predicting sleep and also uh, development across time. So and that's that's my final point, the shameless plug of my work, I guess, too. But that but uh, I, I think it's I, I really do think that we need to, to be trying to get as good a measure or sets of measures of the environment as possible of the family. And that may involve doing it more than one time across multiple days or whatever to get a better sense of what's going on. So um, it is, it is well, it's noon my time. So, uh, and 5 p.m. Helen's time probably and 7 p.m. Liat's time. And I'm not sure, you know, and we're with everybody mm -hmm. else, but I do want to thank everybody uh, for participating in this. This has been a fantastic uh, session. Um, I, I couldn't be more, uh, Yes, just delighted to work with Helen and with Liat on this, and and I couldn't be more delighted to have uh, Maureen and Kathy join us, and uh, um, to all of you and to the registrants who who uh, have um, uh, signed up for this. Uh, thank you very much for joining us, and I hope you found this uh, session to be uh, useful in some way to your own work. And I uh, would love to hear more about that, um, you know, in separate communications with me or with anybody on the panel. So. Uh, but thank you all. Thank you all very much for, for uh, participating. Thank you all. It's so nice Thanks to see you. Thank you. Yeah, it was great. wonderful. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.